Colleagues, good morning. Uh, welcome to the 16th meeting of the Health and Sport Committee in 2019. Uh, we have received apologies from Emma Harper, David Stewart and Brian Whittle. Uh, they are at Westminster today participating in the Scottish Affairs Committee uh, on behalf of this committee. Uh, Anna Sarwar and Bob Doris are here as substitute members uh, today. Uh, I would ask everyone in the room please ensure that uh, mobile phones are offered on silent. Uh, and can uh, I welcome to the committee uh, Stephen Fitzpatrick, Assistant Chief Officer, and Alan Gilmer, Planning Manager, Older People's Services and South Operations, Glasgow City, IJB, Sandra Ross, uh, Chief Officer, and Kenny O'Brien, uh, Service Manager with Aberdeen City, IJB, and Jim Forrest, Chief Officer, and Yvonne Lawton, Head of Strategic Planning with West Lothian IGB. Our witnesses are here today to assist our inquiry, our pre-budget scrutiny, uh, in which we are following on from the uh, sessions that we've had uh, two weeks ago in public session and also uh, some other work that we've undertaken. Uh, this is all directed towards the budget for 2020-2021, uh, building on the approach we've taken in previous years to highlight issues around integration and integration authorities. Very uh, glad to have you here uh, and welcome you to the committee. Uh, one of the items which this committee has pursued uh, vigorously over the last couple of years is the question of uh, uh, access to financial information or, or the publication of financial information around integration and joint boards. Uh, and uh, we've certainly seen progress in that, but, but nonetheless, um, uh, it is still the case that the financial information we receive regarding the budgets of IJBs is in our ears, uh, qu quarterly in our ears. And therefore, for example, while we know that uh, you will all have set your budgets for the current year, uh, or at least we so assume, um, that financial information is not uh, made available to us for a further three months beyond the decision being taken. I wonder um, uh, whether I could start by asking witnesses if there's any reason why uh, you would not be able to provide uh, financial information directly to Parliament uh, in that timely way. I wonder if anyone would like to start with that uh, uh, question and the question. Basically, um, looking for the most timely information we can obtain, but also recognising the changes that are to budgets of your partner organisations as well. Who would like to kick off? Stephen Fitzpatrick. Happy, happy to start, just to say, I know it's not my responsibility, but I know certainly that our IJB meets um, every six weeks or so and has uh, the monthly financial reports there. Um, and uh, we have just set our budget at our March meeting, so just over uh, two months ago. And uh, that information is in the public domain, so it would be straightforward, I think, to find a mechanism to share that information which is routinely available publicly anyway uh, through the panel. I'm sure that wouldn't be problematic. I will commit my finance colleagues in Glasgow to, to that. I'm sure I'm they'll pleased. be grateful. They will be. Can I ask if, if, if similar situations apply in uh, Sandra Ross? Yeah, our budget um, our budget's been approved um, also and with our partners as well, so I'm sure that we could share that as well. Yes, thank you very much. And Jim Forrest. It's the same position in West Lothian. We um, uh, agreed our budget in March as well. Uh, we meet every six weeks as a, an IGB, uh, and the updated financial information goes through the IGB and is a public document. So if that's the, the detail, Chair, that this committee requires, then uh, we'll happily uh, come up with a mechanism to provide it. That's very helpful. And I think from the way you've described it, uh, the mechanisms you've described, would uh, it, it would appear, uh, be likely to be the same in, in, in each and every one of the IGBs, and I see a lot of nodding uh, to that suggestion. So, so that's perhaps something certainly very grateful for your offers, which um, we'll look to hear from you. But, but I think it's something we, we can also raise more generally uh, in terms of ensuring that uh, such information from all IGBs, is, is, or all integration authorities, I should say, is available uh, to Parliament and to me as we. While on the matter of finance, can I ask uh, more generally whether they move to three-year financial settlements in the NHS and potentially in local government as well, whether that will assist in long-term budgeting and planning uh, for your authority and how it may affect you? Jim Forrest. 
Um, thank you, Chair. Yes, I think it will assist us uh, in financial planning. Clearly, the challenge for us is really to try and get to a stage where we can have sort of medium term and longer term financial planning. It will, if we get that in place, then the strategic planning and the commissioning type uh, decisions that we need to make become clearer. Um, so, yeah, we would we would welcome that. <coughs> I take it that would be the same. Stephen yeah, Fitzpatrick. I mean, I think just to second that, but, and I think it comes through in our evidence submission that um, <coughs> one of the challenges is, is, is the short termism and the uncertainty around the financial settlement. So even if the financial settlement is difficult, there is a value in a degree of certainty. Sorry, uh, degree of certainty um, around what we're facing to allow us to, to make some longer-term financial decisions. So yes. Are there barriers in the way of? longer term planning on, on broad indicative budgets? In other words, are the things that currently you're not able to plan because you can't have certainty about the last one or two percent of your budget lines? Is that something that affects Stephen? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I think yes, um, to an extent, but as you say, it's proportionate to the level of certainty that we have. So we, we do have um, uh, quite a lot of experience and um, indications of, of what we will be facing financially, but nonetheless, um, it's, uh, it can be quite significant if, this, for example, the savings targets that emerge from the, the partner organisations are higher than expected or, or the settlement figures are lower than expected. It can have um, you know, a significant bearing on, on our own kind of detailed planning and so on. So um, being proportionate about it, then uh, it can be at the margins, but at the same time, we would want it to be as certain as, as it can be to us. We have a, a difficult task planning ahead, as I'm sure we'll go through over the course of, of this morning. So as much certainty as possible would be our, our plea. Mm -hmm. uh, Sandra Ross. I would echo that. I would say that um, three-year planning would allow and the areas that would allow us to move more into is the more that round about the prevention agenda, which will impact, especially with the demographics and things shifting as they are, a more um, committed and a more understood um, direction of spend will allow that balance to be moved. Thank you very much. Jim Forrest. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> in addition to uh, what my colleagues have sort of imparted to the committee, I mean, clearly there's a number of things that we have to be mindful of in terms of financial planning. So at the moment, we have to do a degree of forecasting based on some of the settlements that are coming out. Clearly, um, as we move to, sort of, particularly in the health services, sort of national wage settlements and negotiations with staff side organisations, that takes a while for that to be negotiated. And then there has to be a decision of whether the budgets will be increased to pay for these uh, increased uh, salaries or whether it's partly uh, going to be paid for centrally and some additional efficiencies. So there are there are some things that you know you have to try and sort of balance out of where where you think it's going to be, what you think the you know pay settlements are going to come out at. Sometimes we get that right. Sometimes we're a bit adrift of that, um, and you know clearly that has an impact because uh, salaries are, are probably our most significant cost. Sure. Can I, the other area I'd like to ask about in terms of setting the scene uh, more generally is benchmarking. We heard at the last evidence session with uh, Eddie Fraser and, and other witnesses about work done to learn from, uh, by IGBs, to learn from each other's experience and to set uh, benchmarking. I wonder if you could tell us what access you have to benchmarking data from other integration authorities and, and, and what use you're able to, to make of that. Is there... Are there good examples that we should be aware of? Yeah. Jim Forrest. Uh, locally uh, in West Lothian, um, the local authority has a sort of benchmark and family of other local authorities, which we've used as a basis to start looking at how we perform, particularly in social care, uh, across that. We are in the process of looking at how we would incorporate the health information to do the same thing to give us that sort of coterminosity and consistency. I suppose we benchmark across a whole range of activity. If you're speaking financial, it's probably not so much uh, my area, but we do tend, as you similar to, to Lothian, to look within our own uh, health board area. So there's a lot of uh, comparisons across uh, our, our constituent um, HSCPs. But in Glasgow, we also try to look further afield as well, just given the nature of our authority to comparable um, health authorities and not restrict ourselves 
all ways to Scotland as well. We will look to Edinburgh and Aberdeen, Dundee, other cities, but often to England as well. So when we are looking at some of the challenges that we face, we will often look to Leeds and Birmingham and Liverpool. And we have a good relationship with Manchester as well and spent a bit of time with their, with our peers there, just looking at some of the same issues in a big complex post-urban, uh, well, post-industrial urban authority. Sure. Sandra Ross. Sure. Ours is, um, we're probably more locally based with using our other health and social care partnerships around about our benchmarking. So um, taking on board what my other colleagues have said, but tends to be more local for ourselves. One of the things that's been striking in looking at the data is that sometimes there's quite a lot of variety, even between close neighbour authorities. Is that something that uh, uh, you, you, you analyse or study in order to learn lessons about uh, what more can be done? Uh, Alan Gilmer. Uh, we, we certainly use a lot of uh, the list resource that's available to us, so that's really, really helpful. Um, and obviously the ISD data, uh, we're forming partnerships through Health Improvement Scotland, and a lot of that is about bringing benchmarking data in for us to use. Um, and we've developed local dashboards, as uh, Stephen was saying, in relation to comparing across our six partnerships that form NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. Um, I think the, 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 the important issue is about comparison so that you're looking at like for like. So I think some of the variation um, it can be explained in different ways, different systems. So it's, it's having that sort of intelligence that sits behind the data to make sure you're looking at the right things. Thank you very much. Yvonne Lawton. I suppose what we've tried to do is, is, is look at the benchmarking data that's available, but also um, visiting other authorities has proven to be very useful um, because you, uh, I suppose you get behind some of that data to understand the circumstances that, that you're comparing. So um, so not only is it about access to data, but the opportunity to, to um, sh share good practice and understand um, the challenges faced in other areas. <coughs> Can you, Brian? Yep. Yes, sir. I, mean, I would echo what my colleagues say. I think my particular area of focus more than anything else is delayed discharge performance and so one of the things there is that yes the top line of comparison is important but then you have to really dig deep underneath for that for example some people may have very differing delayed discharge performances but they may have very different labour markets in regards to social care they may have a different volume of care home beds available within their partnership area so it's then being able to take what the lessons are. And again, I would reiterate that then going and visiting those places and then pulling out the relevant stuff is probably the best thing we can do from benchmarking. And, and it sounds as if that's now quite common practice. Would that be fair to say? That's something that, that, that all authorities engage in. Very good. Um, one of the other questions which we've addressed in previous years is the outcome-based uh, budgeting. And I wonder if... Uh, any of you would like to comment on uh, what support the Scottish Government provides for developing uh, budgeting that, that relates to outcomes? Is that something that uh, you're engaged with or familiar with? Perhaps the fact that... I suspect it speaks volumes that we're looking I, I, across I, to see... Uh, you took the words out yeah. of my mouth. Yes, <laughs> yes. So, so Scottish Government support for outcome-based budgeting is a question yet to be answered. Is that a fair... OK, thank you very much. Um, can we now move on to consider delayed discharge and start with George Adam. Thank you, convener. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, everyone, I know everyone's committed to reducing the number of people who are waiting in the ward to get out to a more suitable. I know everyone's working towards that. And I know Audit Scotland's already said in the past couple of years there's been improvements. But we, we have a table that SPICE have provided in front of us that's got percentage of delayed discharge bed days uh, as a percentage of the population. And it's it's quite varied throughout the whole country. Uh, you know, when you look at it, if I use some examples, uh, you've got Inverclyde at 2.5%, my own area in Renfrewshire, 3.3%, Glasgow City at 5.9%, and uh, you've got East Ayrshire at 4.8%. But if you look at the other side, you've got Aberdeen City at 101 one. Highland at 19.1, and North Ayrshire at 15.3, and West Lothian at 13.6. So there's quite a, a varied difference there. And then my question would be, what is everybody doing differently in these areas? Is it demography, geography, or both? Uh, or uh, is, is it in certain areas there's new ways of working that are working extremely well, or is it simply all of the above? Can you blank? I think you probably covered it with the last statement, all of the above. Um, I, I haven't seen the particular table you've referenced, but what I would say is that 
one of the good things, particularly about delayed discharge data reporting, is that it's quite granular. So it's not just a headline of here are your bed days lost or here are the number of people have delayed. You then get quite deep into the reasons why somebody is delayed. So if you go onto the ISD website, you will see when you get into their Excel spreadsheet, which I am wont to do, but many people are not, I would say that there is very good detail for each of the areas in regards to where there are still delays. Um, so, for example, you will find that in Aberdeen, um, my own area, one of our biggest area of delays still relates to care home placement. And that is partly due to the fact that we have a smaller number of care homes than other areas that are available and accessible to us. That does not in any way mitigate that there has been improvements and there are other things you can do to improve flow out of the hospital. Um, in other areas, it will be more about demographics. In other areas, it will be about the labour market for social care in regards to recruiting home carers to actually allow people to flow home instead. Um, one of the areas that Aberdeen has done better than in other areas is in regards to housing and adaptation related delayed discharges because we've been able to access more of the kind of bricks and mortar to allow to flow people out with disabled access housing. Um, so I think probably the answer is that there's a lot of things that are in play in regards to varying performance, but certainly there are things to learn from those areas that are doing exceptionally well in regards to the reporting. Stephen Yeah, I mean, you asked about benchmarking earlier, and I suppose my sense of it across Scotland is that Scotland as a whole compares very well to England and to the rest of the UK on this, and I think there has been a real focus on it. And again, we, we, Alan and I tend to be... I never asked that question. <laughs> Always been patriotic around uh, the late discharges. <laughs> Alan and I, and I think, I think uh, everyone else um, around the table... Uh, is, is very wrapped up in the whole delayed discharge agenda. It's very, I think, much a priority shared across uh, Scotland, and you tend to look at your own local area, so we're very involved in, in whatever's happening locally. But again, my sense is, um, and it'd be corrected by the data, is across Scotland that there's been an improve, improvement trend over the last number of years, as well as that comparative uh, point to the rest of the UK. Um, but I do think there are significant contextual differences. So certainly in Glasgow, one of our great assets is that we have a very responsive home care service, so something like 65% of our referrals for home care are discharged from wards within 24 hours notice of the referral, so hugely kind of, um, beneficial impact to managing our delays performance, whereas I know that in Edinburgh and other places there's, there's real challenges, and, and Kenny mentioned this about the, the, the kind of workforce and, and the, the, um, the kind of economic kind of context can be different, and, and very often maybe care is a more attractive uh, employment option in a city like Glasgow than it may be in a city like Aberdeen or Edinburgh. So all of these things, I think, have a bearing. We know that practically in terms of our performance and some of the performance differences, but it's quite a complex picture, I think, to explain the differences between different areas, but generally, I think, quite a positive picture over time in, in Scotland. Much. Jim first. <coughs> I think in terms of uh, what was mentioned, I mean, clearly the, the factors that uh, were mentioned around uh, demographics, etc., cetera, are, are very important. From a West Lothian point of view, our performance in delayed discharges probably deteriorated about 18 months to two years ago quite significantly and we took a number of decisions that we we're going to try and remodel the whole service which we're working through at this particular moment in time. So in relation to seeking information from elsewhere, so we sought information from Aberdeen City in terms of the plan they had at the time and what actions that they had put in place. Uh, we've been in contact with our colleagues in Glasgow and various other places. Um, so we've made significant improvements in the last, probably more so in the last six months as a number of these actions have uh, come into play and we've seen significant reductions um, both in delayed discharges and occupied bed days and uh, various other things. There is still work to do, um, so we've learned from the previous uh, framework agreement we had from for Care at Home and we're about to go out to you know, procurement for a, a new uh, framework agreement, which will be radically different from the previous framework agreement. We've also had a number of operational challenges in that time that are out with our control. So the care home market, if we take the care home market in West Lothian, all our care home beds were full. We had no care home beds at all. Um, and clearly uh, we were wait waiting for vacancies to arise. 
So we've worked very closely with the care home providers to try and negotiate some additional beds from them. So as well as uh, West Lothian uh, procuring uh, and commissioning a number of the care home sector, there was about 25% of it that was either uh, people who were self-funders or that beds were being purchased from other local authorities. So we've tried to get uh, some additional beds and give us a higher proportion of the care home beds, which we're now starting to get. Uh, and we'll work very closely with the care home providers on that. Some of the other operational challenges, if we stick with care homes, where we've had a number of care homes who have been under investigation because of their grades dropping, and uh, they don't take any new admissions, quite rightly, at that point in time. Now, that doesn't sound a lot, but if you've got uh, 120 beds that are under investigation and not accessed for admission, that can take you six months to work your way through that, get the assurance you need, and have these care homes open for admissions again. And we've had two or three of them over the past two years. We've also had major challenges in the care at home sector as well, where we've had providers who have been under investigation, unfortunately our largest provider uh, in West Lothian, and we've had to work very closely with them with an improvement plan before they could accept new cases into the, uh, to their caseload. Now, all of that added to the change in demographics, the increase in demand had a fairly uh, fundamental sort of negative effect on our performance. So we've been working quite closely both with the care home providers, the care at home providers, and we've been remodelling our in-house service as well uh, to change that uh, in a way. And we've invested uh, in our in-house service so that uh, a number of the things, such as new cases for uh, assessment and reablement, come through our in-house service before we ask a care at home provider or a care home provider to take them on. Um, and that's work in progress at this moment in time. So, so there's a number of fairly significant operational challenges that we've faced. Um, and you know, we'll deal with these, and there'll be a number of others, but it's about being flexible and dynamic to respond to the challenges that come forward. Just, just when you mentioned, uh, you all mentioned care home provision has been one of the challenges uh, that you have in some of the areas. But uh, from the figures I've got here, uh, Fife is at the higher end, it's at 9.7%, uh, yet I'm led to believe that they have capacity. So just for my own kind of understanding of the situation, uh, why is that a situation in that part? I'm not trying to ask you to tell tales at school. I'm just saying, want to know why would Fife, who have the capacity, still be in the higher end of the scale with regards to uh, care provision? I'm not sure that I can answer uh, in uh -huh. terms of Fife's performance. The only thing I would say is where, <clears throat> where there's been vacancies uh, for care home provision, whether it be in Fife, whether it be in Glasgow uh, or other parts of Lothian, um, my particular authority have made it clear to individuals and their families if they're waiting for a care home place, would they, would they be interested in a, a care home in another part of uh, the country? Um, they would be welcome to go and see it and we would provide the same level of funding that we would provide, whether it would be within West Lothian. Um, we've made these offers, one or two people have sought them out but we have not had many takers for that, mainly for if they don't have a family connection in that particular area and it's more difficult for family to, to visit. Um, where there's been a family connection, we've actively tried to explore that. And we've got cooperation from uh, our, our other partnerships, but that hasn't been an option that's been uh, attractive to families. <coughs> um, the other thing I was going to get, and I can't speak for Fife's data, but what I would say... Any of it. Yeah, I'm just trying to understand yeah. more and if there is yeah. capacity. Yeah. Of course, the point is that care homes are only one part of the puzzle in yeah. regards to delayed discharges. So they may have vacancies and voids within their care home sector, but they could. there is the potential anywhere for you to have vacancies and space within your care home sector and still have significant delayed discharges if you have an issue more, for example, with the care at home market or you have an issue more with housing and adaptations or with social work assessment and provision or legal guardianship and proceedings through the courts to facilitate discharge. So you may well have 20% of your care home capacity free and available, but if the people who are in hospital don't need a care home, if they actually need support to get home, but you've got blocks and barriers and other bits, you could still have capacity, but still have a significant issue with your delayed discharge performance overall. Okay, thank you very much.
Can I get one for One more, George, yep. uh, ba Basically, the Glasgow IGB's paper says there's too much focus on delayed discharges and uh, that detracts from investment in preventative interventions. Uh, can we maybe explore that a wee bit uh, furthermore, what you actually mean by that? So, uh, I've um, recently, I was saying before we came in, been around to various um, locations within our system in the last couple of months, presenting some of this argument, saying over the last number of years, Glasgow has made progress in terms of its uh, delays. Our position back in 2011, 2012 was probably the worst in Scotland. I think it was the worst in Scotland. So we have progressively uh, uh, driven down our delays, although it's been challenging the last couple of years, but we still are relatively low level. And the argument is that you've already realised most of the opportunity to improve the, the kind of overall impact of delays on the system. Yes, we will continue to focus on, on getting to the, the lowest possible number of delays, but by definition, you've already generated most of the benefit over the last number of years, and the system still remains under huge pressure. So I think this week, our hospitals were sitting at 97% occupancy, even though our delayed discharge numbers weren't the they weren't helping, but they weren't the main cause of, of the pressure. So if you really want to address that, your strategic focus needs to move from the back door now, where it's been the last number of years, to the front door, because we think the main efficiencies now are in people who are presenting at the front door and creating demand who could have their needs met somewhere else within the system. And that really is the argument that we've been making within our own system, that if you're too distracted by the back door, you're missing where the real opportunities going forward are, which are at the front door. Uh, and that's where our, our strategic focus needs to be now. Very much. Uh, Anna Sarra. Just on that uh, final point, sorry, good morning. Um, I completely agree the focus needs to be on, on the front door in terms of reducing the number of people that go into hospital and then need to stay in a hospital um, in terms of the long-term strategic outcomes. But, but going back to delayed discharges for, for, a, for a moment, one of the things that Glasgow has successfully done in terms of reducing the delayed discharge numbers is, and I, forgive me, I don't know the name, but you, you'll know it in terms of a, an interim process so that where they're out of the hospital, but not yet either in a care home or in a home setting. What, what's that? Yeah. Intermediate Follow. care. Yeah. So whilst that's welcome in terms of intermediate care because it opens up a bed and it reduces a cost for, for the acute service, it still puts a pressure on the council and the IGB, and it's still not a definitive care plan for the individual involved. So how much of that reduction in delayed discharge figures in terms of that acute setting statistic is people going into these intermediate care and actually not getting into, into final care packages? Uh, Alan may be able to help with the, the specific figures, I think. Um, what I would say is the majority, I always think of the population leaving hospital in different um, cohorts. So the main cohort ideally are people who go home without any need for continuing social care or, or health care involvement. So we don't know what the numbers are. We would not necessarily know that. Then home care is the next level up and that's the, by far the highest volume of people who came out with a care package from Glasgow. The people entering intermediate care tend to be the most complex people who require a social care assessment. So the logic of introducing that model in Glasgow and elsewhere was that um, assessing someone in hospital is, is, is your worst option, if you like. You try to create an environment which is as close to home as possible. Um, and so it's, a, by definition, quite a small minority of, of the population with discharged from hospital, the most complex. And the intention was in Glasgow always that you maximise the opportunity for people to then return home because it's closer to the home environment. It's not exactly the home environment, but it's got a very reablement and rehabilitation focus in a way that traditionally an assessment for social care and complex circumstances on the wards wasn't. And it was, and, and all of the evidence points to that being very detrimental to the long-term outcomes for people if you're assessing them in, in the least um, amenable environment, effectively. So the numbers are, are small, and it's, it was always about maximising the, the prospects of people going home as well as relieving pressure on the acute system. You say the, n the numbers are small. That's in, in terms of all discharges. Of all discharges. So, so obviously, the numbers are going to be small in terms of all discharges. And if, if you look, but if you look solely at those discharges that require a care package of some sort, how significant is the number of, of those that are going into an intermediate care? Well, Alan might be able to tell me in terms of turnover. We have 90 intermediate care beds across the city. Uh, and we run close to 90% plus occupancy at all times. So we would, at any given time, we would expect to have upwards of 80 people um, within our intermediate care system. But there's obviously a turnover within that, so we operate to a four-week target. We don't always meet it. Yep. But our intention is to maintain throughput because we recognise that we can't swap a delay in a hospital bed for a delay in an intermediate yep. care bed. So throughput is a, is a key um, performance measure around intermediate care too. But I get across our uh, performance measures that we attach to that model when we first brought in, we have been 
uh, successful in, 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 in terms of our throughput and uh, returning people to the home environment. Yeah. In the past, these are people who would have gone into a long-term care home, but we're getting quite a high proportion home but, from that. So in terms of the controversy that surrounds delayed discharge or has surrounded delayed discharge over a long time, it's around, one, not having a bed available in an acute care setting. Um, secondly, it's about the huge cost for acute care because it's more expensive yes. keeping someone in hospital than in another setting. But it's also been about a failure to deliver a social care package quickly for someone who is cleared to leave hospital but is stuck in hospital because they can't get a social care package. So for those individuals you're talking about sometimes days, weeks, even months where they aren't getting a social care package so they're stuck in hospital. So yes, we might reduce the delayed discharge by putting them into an intermediate care setting, but isn't the truth that for some people they might get out of the acute setting but then they go into an intermediate care setting where they are stuck for days, weeks and months not getting a social care package. So it, it doesn't appear on the national statistic if you look solely at the delayed discharge figures. but they're in, So it's taken off that figure, but they're then sat in an intermediate care setting where they're waiting weeks, if not months, for a social care package. Well, that, that's not... We, sorry, we have um, a balanced scorecard. We have a lot of data that comes through and we keep a, an eagle eye on our throughput, as I say. So where people are... Uh, beyond our 28-day target, we have a particular focus in intermediate care, so it's the same performance focus in intermediate care. We don't, we cannot afford, our system couldn't achieve the performance it does in delays. Isn't it? Sorry? For someone that's cleared to leave hospital and go home or go to a social care setting, four weeks is still quite a long time to be in an intermediate care setting. Well, essentially, these, these are people who are going to be being assessed within hospital at least for four weeks and longer, so I don't think there's any... We have no sense or evidence that indicates it's taking longer to assess people in that intermediate care setting that we would have done in hospital, but an intermediate care setting is more um, appropriate for their needs, and we are seeing outcomes where those people are, are being supported home in greater numbers. And also, we have seen a, 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 um, a change in terms of their final destination. So the yep. majority of people still get into long-term care, yep. but we have seen a real shift from nursing care and higher levels of, re of, of long-term care to residential care. So the outcomes are not just beneficial in terms of the, the increased number of people who are returning to their own homes, but also lower levels of long-term care as well. So there's, there's been a number of benefits from having those assessments. There. But it's, I'm not disputing that, but it is fair to say that looking crudely at Glasgow's delayed discharge figures being reduced, you cannot directly say that's a great reduction in delayed discharge, meaning people are getting their social care packages quicker and getting into that setting. That, that's a very crude way of looking at it. You can't do that alone just from looking at the delayed discharge if, figures. If you, if you were to um, assume intermediate care was equivalent to staying in the hospital bed, that would be, that would be right, but that wouldn't be my assumption because intermediate care is a social care service. It's not an NHS service. It's... It's but it's also not a final destination in terms no, of no, it's either not a care package at home or a social care setting. Um, and one final question, sorry, which is, um, um, Kenny O'Brien, I completely agreed with um, your point around the difficulty around capacity and, and still having high delayed discharge figures. But one of the things perhaps that's also missing is money. And if you, you might have the capacity to fill a social care place, but if you don't have the money to put someone into that social care place, that place may remain vacant. So how much of it is around not having adequate budgets around local government, around IGBs, to be able to use the capacity you have to deliver those social care packages? I mean, I, I can only speak locally to my context in Aberdeen, but certainly that's not the case in Aberdeen. Um, I have never had a scenario. I'm operationally in charge of hospital social work. Mm -hmm. So I actually handle the placements in the professional decision making as a social worker in relation to people going into care home settings or going back to their own home setting or to sheltered housing or any other setting. I've never yet in my period of time working there over the last four years had a situation where I've had spare bed capacity or spare care home capacity and it's been restricted to me on the grounds of budget. Can Glasgow say the same? Yeah, I mean, we... Um... <laughs> We obviously, like everyone else, uh, face uh, significant pressures on our budgets, and that's our, our biggest budget is our purchased uh, care home budget. But for a number of years, we haven't had any delays uh, in, in, uh, for um, financial reasons, so no one delayed it um, because uh, budget isn't available. But what I would say is that our care home budget last year was the most difficult it's been to manage for a significant period of time, and we did overspend uh, against that budget, and already this year we're seeing significant pressure on, on that budget two months into the financial year, so we are experiencing significant pressure around that budget. Thank you. Other call,
Thank you very much, Kamina. Good morning to the panel. I'd like to ask about delayed discharge as well, um, not least because I, whilst I recognise there's nobody from Edinburgh here, Miles and I as Edinburgh MSPs were very dismayed to see an increase of 6% in delayed discharge in the capital last year. Um, I wanted to ask, following on from Anas Sarawar's question, um, Stephen Fitzpatrick, you referenced uh, the different cohorts of people that might fall into the bracket of delayed discharge or, or the cohort that's leaving hospital. I wanted to ask about fourth cohort that I think exists and that is we often assume that delayed discharge is for people who have been declared fit to go home and are well enough uh, to either go home or to a care setting but there's another class of people who are at the end of life and really hospital has done all they can for that person and it may be in the interests of the individual or their family or both of them and their families for them to spend their remaining days at home. I would put it to you that they are another category of delayed discharge that if there is insufficient hospice care to receive them uh, or that clinicians are not supported to have those conversations to support families to go home that we are creating another cohort of people who are otherwise taking up hospital beds. How would you respond to that? Can I start with you Stephen? Um, well, I think if you if you look at our data again, comment on the local data, that that's certainly a performance target for us is to support a higher proportion of people to to die at home rather than uh, hospital. And again, Alan will correct me if I'm wrong on this, but it's been it's been creeping up in the right way over a period of years uh, around that. So we are making some progress. I think again, it comes back also to the front door as well, and, and it's a priority within our unscheduled care programme to try to avoid avoidable admissions for people with palliative and end-of-life diagnosis, because there is a danger when people are as gravely ill that the system responds by drawing them into hospital when actually a more effective intervention might be to support them in a different way. So we're looking at that for different populations, including people who are very close to end of life and other people who have a, a terminal diagnosis but aren't close to end of life and, and um, their, their conditions may be dynamic and so on. So what can we do differently to support them um, being admitted? And I think that's where um, we will get most progress because we always know when people are admitted to hospital, that's that's probably the, the, the kind of worst factor in terms of determining their long-term outcomes. Yes, we will try to um, affect as early and positive a discharge for that population too once they are admitted, but I think it's a twin-track approach. You try to stop people going in, and we have a focus uh, on that at this point in time. One of the, the um, positives in Glasgow in the last couple of years is that we have taken on from the acute system the management of the... Um, two hospice contracts in the city and we're working very well with Marie Curie and PPW to try to expand that model away from just a beds-based model so can we use their expertise and their value base and so on in a way which helps us to, to, to create more pathways out of hospital for the population and to support the population living within the community. So we are very actively looking at that but I think it's a, a point well made that there's a danger that um, the system fails that, that population and they remain in hospital to the end of their lives when they could possibly do something else. But. Because you make a very good point that um, I think culturally um, primary care clinicians have sought to draw people into hospitals when their situation is very grave or life-threatening or life-ending. Um, and uh, I think Catherine Calderwood, as CMO, set out a, a very interesting prospectus in realistic medicine. But how are each of your authorities or your health boards or your IJBs supporting clinicians to change that culture within the hospital and to say, actually, we could intervene, but it's probably better for everyone if we don't and we just support that person to go home and be comfortable? Um, <coughs> certainly, I would say that I would agree with my colleague that it has to be at both ends of the spectrum. There is the element of realism at the point of primary care and also social care, because it's not just about the GP in the room. It's about a GP can make decisions in relation to realistic medicine, in relation to what are the, the thresholds of intervention for an individual who has a life-limiting illness and is at end of life. But if you don't have the social care resource and the family support to wrap around that clinical decision, it means nothing in the first place. So that, yes, certainly there is work already being done there. I'm participating along with some of my colleagues from both acute primary care and within the third sector right now in relation to some workshops and some strategic work we're doing about the palliative pathway across Grampian, Grampian wide rather than just in Aberdeen City. But also it's very much the case that for clinicians in hospital, we're trying very much to work with them in relation to early case conferencing, doing a lot of work in regards to anticipatory care planning for when someone goes out. So, I mean, just yesterday I chaired a case conference for an individual with a life-limiting illness where the agreement was that the person had 
to be fair, not inappropriately, but had bounced in and out a little bit in regards to admissions in, admissions out, admissions in, admissions out. And we were taking stock and actually saying that, well, you know what, all including the family are in agreement that this is now a situation where we have to make a call. Is this now a situation where we will tolerate higher levels of dependency and medical instability within the community because it's part of this person's journey and their wish to remain at home rather than bouncing in and out of hospital. And so we as a partnership are trying to facilitate that more with anticipatory care planning and with that anticipatory care planning moving a lot more seamlessly, for example, between in the case yesterday, the consultant geriatrician on the ward, the community nursing staff and the GPs and even trying to do some cleverer stuff with loading all that anticipatory care planning into the computer system so that the ambulance service can see it as well. So we are trying to really move upstream. So rather than a crisis point where you're talking about the point of hospital admission and only then in a bit of a pressurised situation going, are we going to do it or are we not? We're trying to pull that kind of point of decision back a little bit so it's a bit more of a rational and reasoned decision when there's not pressure. Makes sense. Alan Gilmer. Just in terms of add adding to, to what Stephen has said there, as well as the relationship with the hospices, we also have a, a palliative care pathway that we work very closely with Macmillan. Um, so that's very much a community home-based uh, package. Um, I'd reiter reiterate the big win here is around anticipatory care. So, and that's about having all stakeholders signed up to that, understanding, aware of that process, um, so that everybody is clear uh, what to do in the event of um, somebody deteriorating. Um, and we've had lots of examples in the way that Macmillan respond and support, and our own community support is available that actually stops people from going into hospital unnecessarily. And it's quite a, obviously, it's a can be quite a distressing experience. And, uh, you know, I think probably ourselves and most other partnerships do recognise that cohort of people um, in terms of whether you class it as end of life or palliative. Um, so we, we do target that, that group and try and support where we can do. Thank you very much. Um, Bob Doris. Thank you. Um, I want to follow up on Anna Sarwar's comments, but I think I should put on the record um, following the line of questioning. Alex Cole Hamilton, she's a cross party group in palliative care in the Scottish Parliament, and I've met with um, uh, um, palliative consultants uh, who are hospital based in the acute sector, and I think they would want me to say that for a small amount of uh, vulnerable patients, that uh, they, they finish off the last few days or weeks of their lives in an acute setting, and they put out an appeal to say that an acute setting should also be a high quality, appropriate, sensitive. A place for someone to have the last few days or weeks of their lives and that's sometimes patient and family choice as well and they've had a concern over the years that quite rightly because of wanting to uh, the majority of people wanting to finish their lives in a at home or homely setting as much as possible that we shouldn't forget about the quality of care required for a, a cohort um, at hospitals. I hope you don't mind me using that, that, that opportunity. I think they'd be remiss of me not, not, not to do that. Um, but Anna Sarwar made some really interesting points about uh, the success Glasgow has, has clearly had. I want to look at the sustainability of that success, but I think we should flush out a little bit more of the, the role of intermediate beds. And I always use intermediate beds, I use the expression step down beds as opposed, as opposed to intermediate. And what I had in my head, and I would like some reassurances over this, or else I might tend to agree with Anna, that uh, the step-down beds, you're doing something a bit different from the acute sector. So I'd be looking to see my constituents, and I've got experience with this with constituents in this case, who are having better access to physiotherapists, better access to OTs, better stimulation, because quite often my constituents, and I've had the caseload, um, it's not clear whether someone is fit to go home. And sometimes there's a wrestling between an individual in Glasgow not wanting to go home, because they don't actually think they can be sustained at home, but they need a care solution. And Glasgow is saying, no, we think we can support you at home. Or the contrary, actually. So it's not always clear cut about when someone is ready, willing, or wants to go home. So back to those 90 beds, intermediate or step down in Glasgow. What reassurance can Glasgow give that those beds are doing something different other than just taking 90 people out of an acute hospital bed and put them into a step down bed so that it changes the figures a bit. So what is there that's different that happens in that intermediate or step down setting? Alan Gilmer. Um, so of our 90 beds, it's very much uh, 
uh, community rehabilitation model. So the locations of those are within care homes. They're in specific um, wings of the care home. So that's quite important because it's not part of the broader general population. So there's very much a focus on this group of 15 individuals within each, each of the locations. Uh, wrapped around that is a whole multidisciplinary team that includes our community rehab uh, uh, colleagues with physiotherapy OT, um, nursing staff, we also have social care staff who are involved in that and very much the focus of that is about assessing the individual within that environment but also providing that rehabilitation opportunities and we've actually been pleasantly surprised by the number of people who whilst in the hospital setting the view may have been that they would either go to a long-term nursing home placement um, we've managed to maybe rehabilitate them to a stage where they've gone to a residential placement or alternatively um, they've actually gone home so it, it does lend itself to those opportunities. And I think the, the important thing is about understanding um, the, the, the cohort, understanding the individuals. So these are, are actually um, some of the most complex, frail individuals um, where you're actually taking them uh, from an acute setting, bringing them into a care home, allowing them to have um, some time to be assessed, to look at various options, to engage with the family, uh, to provide a whole range of um, <laughs> physical and other support uh, to, to progress the individuals. And actually, our drive really is is we would like our default position to be home um, as, a, as an outcome of, of, of intermediate care. But what it does do is it allows us to have a, a more effective assessment of the individual and look for any opportunities to improve their independence, reduce their frailty uh, within the system. Kenny O'Brien and then Stephen Gough. The other thing I would say from Aberdeen's perspective is that we also have intermediate care, but we've divided it as well. It's not just care homes for us. We have 20 beds within a care home that deliver intermediate care with wraparound physiotherapy and occupational therapy. But also we have 19 flats that are specifically designed to mimic a person's own front door and their own home with the idea being that there's occupational therapy and physiotherapy there as well. And we find that is exceptionally useful, particularly in the borderline cases where you can't really tell from when someone's sitting in an acute hospital bed, whether it's going to be safe or not, and exactly the volume of care or support they're going to require. What we do also find is that when people are out of a hospital bed and are having to, you know, to be honest, get up and get to the bathroom, get up to the kitchen themselves, even if we're giving them support, because they're doing that and having actual significant activity, what we do find is our baseline of what we thought they might require before they go into intermediate care, and then the amount of care and support and social care they require when they leave intermediate care, it tends to come down the way. And that's a win for everybody because social care is a scarce resource. So if we can actually use intermediate care to size appropriately and reduce to the, the minimum that's safe and necessary for somebody to go home, the level of care they'd require, we find that to be quite a win. We had one individual also who we didn't think would ever get home. Um, he was a complex brain injury. And we've managed to step him down into his own front door and he's surprised us all. And that that's the good news story of intermediate. It's not just about cohorting people who would otherwise have been in a hospital bed. It's also about giving people that opportunity to show they can do something as well when perhaps they're not able to demonstrate that when they're stuck in a bay of six people in a hospital bed. I think just I don't want to miss this point. Um, when we designed the intermediate care model, step down model, which you're, you're right to describe as principally, um, we were always very conscious this wasn't just about relieving pressure on delayed discharges and improving the performance of the acute system. There was an equally important target around supporting people to get home who in the past would always have gone into long term care. This population, as Alan describes, are, are very complex and in the past in Glasgow would invariably have gone into long term care. So the whole ethos of the system is driven by that dual um, target and it was part of the discussion with the acute system colleagues around it's not just about relieving pressure on the acute system, we also place a value on supporting people to get home so it is something different. Just very, very Please, briefly, yep. can we this question we just be left hanging there for giving information back to the committee, but I, mean, I get a reassurance that uh, the theory behind stepping in intermediate beds is very different from the, the acute sector. So that gives me those reassurances. However, that's an assertion, I, I, I suppose, that we're hearing today. 
Um, I'm merely passing through this committee as a substitute member, but I'd be very interested to know the cost per patient per day in a step-down facility vis-à-vis -vis the acute sector. It may very well be more intensive and therefore more, more costly, but as Mr O'Brien is saying, that might be that short-term intensive support to quicker enablement. You, they kind of use it or lose it theory behind any enablement that I have seen with my constituents might be very beneficial. Be interested to know the average duration uh, for each patient in a step down facility before they go to their, their their eventual destination, be that long term care, residential care, or, or enablement at home, and how you actually monitor the outcomes out of that. So. Is, is, is the situation breaking down two or three weeks later and there's a follow-up acute admission or acute admissions reducing in those circumstances? I don't expect you to answer any of these questions just now, but it, it's an assertion that step-down care is very different from acute care. That's my experience with my constituency caseload, but unless we get some data around it, we can't flesh any of that out, convener. Uh, very briefly, does anyone want to offer numbers today? Uh, uh, Kenny O'Brien. I can give you one bit of the numbers just now. Um, so in regards to our intermediate bets um, within the social care sector, that would be priced at approximately £900 per week. Now, in regards to uh, one thing that appears is very difficult to put a price on is the cost per bed per day in a hospital, because depending on the speciality, depending on the ward, depending on the other things that are in there, NHS Grampian, which is the board that I contribute to as part of the Health and Social Care Partnership for Aberdeen City, put a, a minimum bed day cost, I think it was in the £270 per day realm, and that's minimum. There will be other beds, and depending on where you pull from, the cost will be higher because it's neurology or it's got more specific diagnostics or other things in there. So if you compare that, if it's £270 per day versus a £900 a week, we find it's the cost-benefit analysis works well in regards to that. At least a 50%... At least a 50% yeah. reduction in cost by comparison. Alan Gilmer. And just in terms of the, the context, I think uh, you, you have to understand that there's also a cost to make the wrong decision. Um, so if you rush into a decision, you're actually potentially pushing somebody into a placement that maybe isn't what they want. And, you know, so there is a, there is a, a cost in, in that. For, for the Glasgow model, we're very closely on top of, of all aspects of the, the throughput in terms of intermediate care. So we look at the, the outcomes data that includes people going to nursing home, residential readmissions. Um, we also look at uh, included within that is the development of clustered supported living. So that's that's become a, a major benefit for, for the population of Glasgow in terms of, a, of an outcome, in terms of making sure that we work very closely with housing to develop that. Um, in terms of our readmission rate, um, again, you have to understand the context of the, of the client group. They are some of the most complex, most frail individuals. Um, so actually, you know, the placement is at risk of readmission. So our readmission rate is around about 10%. Um, and actually, in discussion with our acute colleagues, they, they actually ass assess that as being well within a, a threshold. They, they would accept that as being uh, acceptable. We do look in detail at the reasons for readmissions. So again, that's, there, is a, there is an audit process that sits underneath that. So again, that's about learning from that and saying, are there any themes that we can, we, we can address in terms of trying to prevent that? But generally speaking, it's because this is the most complex and frail uh, client group that we have. Very helpful. Good Excellent. Question. That's very helpful. And uh, if you were able to provide more of the numbers in due course, that would be that would add to our uh, knowledge in this area. Miles Briggs. Thank you, uh, convener, and good morning to the panel. Um, I wanted to follow on um, from what Alan Gilmore's just said there, because I was wanting to pursue a bit more um, attitudes around um, hospital admissions and how we change that, and almost a presumption against um, admission. Um, so I wanted to see, in terms of innovation, um, I know around the country there's different things um, IJBs are looking to, to take forward. Um, and one area which um, is of interest to me is around the number of uh, people living with dementia and actually how often um, they're the ones who are being readmitted. And I know Aberdeenshire have looked towards um, a dementia village um, to sort of address that patient need. And I wondered if you had examples of other... Um, ways we're stopping hospital, hospital um, being the end point for people in that care package. Who would like to start? Pre, how to defer or avoid hospital admissions? Sandra Ross. Okay. So um, I could give you some examples around about Aberdeen City. 
um, less about Pacific population and more about looking at the whole um, prevention of admission agenda. So we've tested out um, an art, have implemented acute care at home, which was initially started off as to be geriatrician led, um, it was where people had been either coming out of hospital or turned around at the front door or not having to come in at the, at, at, to start with. Due to um, issues with recruitment, consultants and things like that, we've morphed that model slightly and we've, we're looking at ENP led, making sure it's a much more multidisciplinary team led. We've mixed, we're now aligning it with our um, West Visiting Service, which is a service that's there. Um, we're also aligning our out of hours district nursing and aligning our um, 24 hour social care call out as well. So by starting to look and joining up all those all those areas across the system, which up until now had been working very independently, what we're starting to see is that we have a real, um, the GPs are much more confident now in saying they will maintain that clinical oversight of people where we'll be able to prevent the admissions. And it's um, we're working closely with care homes, we're working closely with um, all areas across the system and starting to see real uh, benefits um, as we can stop admissions coming in. Okay. Stephen Fitzpatrick. Um, I think there's a, a number of um, approaches certainly in Glasgow we're looking at in relation to this. So we've had our dementia strategy for the last number of years and we've been looking at, again, that prevention of admission and, and supporting people to live with dementia for longer in the community. So a uh, focus on the five pillars approach um, at the early stages of, of the illness and the eight pillars approach Glasgow has helped um, pilot as well for more advanced stages. Big focus on family and care support, sustaining that, the application of technology enabled care, so GPS and so on, all of these things things to, to try to um, mitigate risk of admission uh, is, is a big part of it. Going forward, um, we have a review of all of our older people mental health services because very often um, dementia uh, is associated with uh, older people mental health in patient beds rather than the mainstream acute system. Um, and so much of our focus now is on how might we continue to shift the balance of care there. I think we've shifted the balance of care from OPMH inpatient beds by about 15% over the last six or seven years. We think there's some scope to go further there, but we're in conversation with our um, psychogeriatricians and other um, lead consultants around what might the model look like differently now going forward, which might allow some of these patients to be supported somewhere else. And it might be in their own homes. It might be in some inter interim um, setting like a care home. But it, it might then have an impact on how their skills and, and resources are being deployed. So rather than the patient coming to them in an inpatient setting, might they be outward facing and, and provide more of a, an outreach service? And what might that look like? And we're, we're in discussion at the moment. We're in the early stages of that. We've been doing some work. We had a session with them at the end of February on this at Stop Hill Hospital. And some ideas emerged from that about how you might make that a practical reality. So it's something that we're looking at um, where we think it might be avoidable for people to be inpatient, that we can support them safely. But it's a range of approaches, I think, for that population. Jim Forrest or Yvonne Lawton. Thank you, Chair. Um, in addition, um, in West Lothian, um, particularly for uh, people with dementia and older people in general, we um, seconded the GP um, to work with a nurse practitioner uh, and go around all of our care homes uh, in West Lothian and look at how we would set in place uh, anticipatory care planning for those who were in care homes that included those with dementia. And the results of that um, have been that for those care homes and those GP practices that engaged, uh, which was about 90% uh, of our GPs, um, we've reduced admissions to hospital fairly significantly from care homes. In addition, um, we've put uh, a mental health team in led by psychology as pos positive behavioural support for those residents in care homes and to work with the care home staff to manage behaviours that people may have due to their uh, illness um, and how they should manage that. And we've been working quite successfully across uh, care homes uh, from that perspective, which has seen a significant reduction in admissions as well. And it's actually meant the care home providers staff feel equipped to deal with people as they have an exacerbation of their condition, because the what have happens from time to time, and it gives that sort of professional confidence that they're able to, to do that. We've also got a system in West Lothian where there's uh, a GP a pr practice uh, attached to a care home and the district nursing team 
from that GP practice, both the GPs and the district nurses visit these particular care homes and do the equivalent of a round in terms of how we update things and the care homes have uh, direct contact with um, uh, that provision. We've looked at increasing our post-diagnostic support for those newly diagnosed with dementia and increased the resource there and are working in that. And we've reconstituted a uh, community mental health team specifically focused on the over 65s. Um, it's work in progress um, and has shown positive results. One of the areas that I think we all need to get into is for those who are in a much younger age group diagnosed with uh, whatever form of dementia and how we uh, support uh, families uh, to to work with those uh, young individuals. Uh, and it's quite frightening for somebody who's young, who still degrees, you know, retains a degree of understanding that their, uh, you know, their, their memory and other capacities are beginning to fail. So there's a, there's a whole challenge in how you manage that and, and how we do that. And that's probably better managed in a home setting with the same routine um, that is consistent, that the, the individual understands what's going on, which we're working uh, on at the moment. But unfortunately, we're seeing uh, a number of cases coming up where um, people who are um, fairly young uh, are, are diagnosed with a condition, and that's a challenge moving forward as to how we deal with that. In terms of acute care at home, we have a, a what we call a REACT team, which uh, uh, manages to... So the idea basically is that we will provide acute care at home, and if we can deal with the exacerbation of the condition, then the person remains at home. If we've put in acute care at home and their condition is still deteriorating, they've got contact with the hospital services, we then admit the person. So the, the, the change in the dynamic is that from what used to happen before we had these services, that people would be sent up to hospital for an assessment and a decision as to why or what we should do. That decision is made at home now that either you're staying at home and we've managed it or you need to be admitted because of this condition and here's what needs to happen. One of, one of the key challenges, I think, um, which has been highlighted to, to us um, by other organisations is the sustainability of the care home sector. Now, Scottish Care obviously have highlighted um, what they're calling a crisis um, in provision. And we know certainly here in the capital, um, private homes um, closing or going into administration. Um, what's your reading of the situation now? Because um, from what Scottish Care, I think I'm right, saying they predicted a need for another 2,000 beds um, across the country, and we're actually losing beds. So in terms of your own areas, I know they're very different in terms of the care sector market, Glasgow obviously having a, a larger supply of council owned and operated, but where's your reading currently of where we're going and the sustainability of the care sector? Uh, Jim Forrest. I mean, I think the, the care sector uh, we have got, it's a fairly sort of fragile, sort of uh, difficult area. Um, in term, I mean, I think we have to be realistic and that if you're going to have beds of any description, that's a very high cost decision that you have to make. Um, so I think you have to make best use of the assets that you have at that particular time. If you're to speak to people, invariably, most people would say they want to remain at home with the services coming to them with the least disruption for as long as they possibly can. So I think some of the sustainability has to be on how we further develop our care at home models, um, how we learn from the experience and the differences of the various populations of how we do that. It's not a blueprint that you can pick off the shelf. There are some pointers there, but you have to modify them to, to your own population. The public opinion would be that they want to remain in their own home for as long as possible. And I think we have to d develop a service model that allows that to happen, but delivers good quality outcomes for the individuals as well. And free up some of the capacity that's already there so that if somebody really needs to be in a care home because that's the most appropriate way to meet their needs, then they're able to get access to that, um, not waiting five, six, seven or eight weeks to get access to it at the time that they need it. And I think the key to all of this is whether it's care at home or care home or hospital, that you deliver the interventions at the time the person needs it for the period of time that they need it, and then you move uh, uh, and change it from there. And 
that's easy to describe, but it's quite a dynamic process that will require constant maintenance and constant development. Thank you very much. Sandra Ross. Um, thanks, Chair. I would like to say that um, I, I think that sustainability within the care home sector, both care homes and care at home, um, requires some personally some honest conversations. Um, we're embarking on an approach within city, looking at commissioning in its realist sense, looking at a co-production approach, a co-produced approach. We're meeting with our um, procurement teams, with our care managers, with our, with all our providers, and putting some basic, having really honest conversations where we put cards on the table and say, this is what's facing us in the terms of demographics. This is what's facing us in the terms of finances. This is what's facing us in terms of workforce. How are we, we going to collectively as a whole system start to look at that? And I think until we start to work together and start that, um, start working as a whole system across that, that bit and working genuinely in partnership as partners, that we will continue to have this conflict and this competition which is in the care home sector. Because at the moment, I think, um, well, I feel that what we have done through procurement and through different modelling is that what we've, in, what we've ingrained a an environment of competition within our providers, within our, we, we've, we've said, how can we get the cheapest? How can we get the most? How can we get this? We haven't focused on outcomes. We haven't looked at that. And we certainly haven't looked at sustainability. If we want to start looking at collaboration, we want to start whole system approaches. We have to start from a co-produced approach. So I totally respect um, opinion of my colleague. I think from our perspective, we will set, we're, we're embarking on that co-produced. What that will mean is that we will have to take longer and there will be some very difficult conversations but it's the honesty and the joint approach on that i think that's what will bring about some real sustainability Thank you very much stephen Gull uh, fitzpatrick um i think <coughs> glasgow's all in a different position to what jim was describing for west Lothian. we've never had a problem with um under provision historically in glasgow of, of care home places we have had a problem historically of over provision uh, and that, I think, was associated very much with um, a lot of speculative development about 10, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, uh, sometimes associated with lower land values in the east end of Glasgow. So we tend to have a real concentration of, of provision, which we hadn't commissioned by design, but was there. And our system responded to that by placing people because the capacity existed. And, and that was something that we consciously, um, at a strategic level, wanted to change because... Uh, we thought, and there's quite a lot of evidence for this, we were accelerating people's journey into care before they had to be there against probably their, their wishes sometimes. So we have consciously over the last number of years sought to um, impose greater tests around admission to care, and we have seen a shift in our balance of care, home placements reducing by about 20% over the last six or seven years. Um, and some care homes in Glasgow have closed probably because we are the biggest customer there, but we think we're probably closer to the right balance now, and I think we might be reaching the end of that journey. We're now starting to see that demand picking up again. It's a reference to our, the pressure on that budget I mentioned earlier. So I think we're probably closer to the balance, but we don't have a, an issue within Glasgow around sustainability, but we recognise it's different to other parts of Scotland. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, David Torrance. Thank you, good convener, and a good morning, panel. Um, you've talked about a, lot, a lot about shifting to the balance of care um, and given various examples of how we've managed to achieve that from uh, hospital to community care. Um, has enough been done to share these good practices across everybody? All the different boards. Because it's all various different ones you've given here in front of you, but and all different examples. Is enough being done to share that good practice amongst yourselves? Kenny O'Brien. Um, what I would say is that I don't think it's 100% consistent across all the different areas that we're doing things. I mean, in my area of expertise, which is delayed discharge, there is quite a lot of that. There are conferences where we all meet. There are visits sponsored by, for example, the government to actually see high-performing areas, probably because of its very visibility. There's a lot more being pushed there in regards to the sharing of what's being done in other areas, sharing of action plans, sharing of models of care. Uh, I'm not 100% convinced that across all the different elements of what we're doing that we're there yet, if I'm being honest. And perhaps particularly around the shift from hospitals to community care, is, yeah. would that be one? I, I would say yes, but I would say probably because of the myriad different ways that you can shift that balance, in essence, a lot of it is almost everything we do now in regards to partnerships. So if you want to deal with that issue of shifting that balance of care from hospitals to community, you're really at everything that partnerships have got their fingers in the pie in. Yvonne Lutton. So I, I think we talk about shifting the balance of care and moving it from hospital to community in lots of ways 
I feel we should be looking at it from the other angle, that, that um, if we presume that home is the first place that we want to be, um, how can we design our systems around maintaining someone at home for as long as possible? So whilst we're dealing with um, short-term um, challenges uh, or, or challenges that we're being faced with now, um, thinking about longer-term planning um, perhaps needs to have a different focus and be focused on that home first approach um, and building systems around individuals and and um, community settings uh, and and designing those systems from from um, that perspective rather than from um, a shifting the balance of care perspective. Yeah. Uh, Stephen, yeah, I mean, I think more can always be done. I think a lot is happening uh, as Kenny's described, but there's always room for improvement around this because it's a complex world and so much is happening. You see a lot of innovation out there and, and sometimes you, you happen upon it by accident. Um, but I do also think there's an onus on all agencies, including the HSCPs, to be looking at this proactively. So it comes back to the benchmarking point. If you see another authority performing very well, then it generally piques your interest and, and rarely a day or week will go past where we don't say, well, how come Inverclyde are achieving this or such and such achieving that? Let's go and find out more uh, about that because you need to dig under the numbers. But as I said earlier, we're always looking, Glasgow, try to look externally and avoid the temptation to just be too insular. So next week, for example, we've got a delegation of senior managers going down to Coventry because they have um, managed to achieve budget sustainability around social care in very straitened circumstances in England, whilst performing very well on their uh, acute performance uh, in terms of delays and uh, so on, So, and their balance of care. So we're always looking uh, to see if there are other models there and, and we can learn from other approaches that, that uh, fit with our own strategic uh, priorities. So we're trying to look outwards as well as just uh, look at, look at uh, what's happening in our own authority area. Thank you very much. David Torrance. Is it realistic to achieve a reduction in resources allocated to hospital care in the context of a rising demand, demographic uh, pressures and prescribing costs? There's a big question. Who would like to go have a go at that? Alan Gilmore. I think there's, the, there's a, a balance here in terms of um, improving and using what you've got to the best ability, where eventually you'll get to a point where your capacity is is being outstripped by the demand and you, you cannot deny the changes in, in the population. Um, there are a lot of things I think that we, we can do that are anticipatory in nature. So if we can really reinforce the health improvement agenda, we can really um, try and get a better, healthier population, but also to have things in place that support decision making later. So for example, the power of attorney and guardianship is, is a real is a big win for Scotland. We we in Glasgow have uh, we ran a couple of campaigns in relation to power of attorney. We've got another one underway. Um, we're looking at that with with our acute colleagues. Um, we're supporting that through our carers agenda. So uh, again, any opportunities to be anticipatory in nature will hopefully uh, ameliorate some of that. Sandra Ross. Okay. Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, I would say the, what, the question you pose is quite a difficult one <laughs> to answer, but um, just picking up really from a colleague uh, and, and also from Yvonne, I think it is really about how we're designing our systems and starting to look whole system and starting to look at um, how do we prevent and how do we shape that prevention agenda? How do we start to say, how do we have fitter, um, you know, focus on our children, have fitter adults and therefore less ill? Um, population and that will start to help to shift some of that balance because otherwise if we continue as we are doing at the moment as you say um, it will be extremely difficult given the demographics to maintain that. Okay. Sandra Hart. Thank you very much Chair and good morning and thank you for your written submissions which I found really interesting and your evidence as well it's been uh, very honest I think uh, I think as Sandra Ross had, had said also I want to concentrate on the set aside budgets uh, we're talking about obviously budgets and lack of funding, etc. Uh, and when you look at uh, set aside budgets, it gets a bit uh, problematic, if you might say. Uh, and I feel as though they're not operating as they're intended to do. But obviously, I'd like to ask the panel members, uh, you know, basically, if the set aside budgets in your minds are operating uh, for what they're intended to do in your areas, and uh, if it's not, what's stopping it from working that way? Sandra Ross. Start. Thank you, Chair. Um, so 
so I'll start off, yeah, I'm fairly new, came into post in, in September. So so one of the areas that we do have um, strategic responsibility is strategic planning for the services with the set-aside budget. So we've been working quite closely with the three IJBs, so it's Aberdeenshire, Murray and Aberdeen City, along as NHSG for um, NHS Grampian for the whole area. And what we've agreed as a system is to start to look at it, whole system, to look at um, so, so to take the money that was within the system, so for, for example we've started with mental health and um, care of the elderly, palliative care, those are all at different phases. We've agreed that whatever money is there, that will sit there and then we will look at it's a, a whole range of workshops and professionals, so that's across the third sector, um, people who use the service, professionals um, within acute, within community and all that and looking and saying what is our strategic direction, what is our aim and when we, we're almost at the end of um, our mental health one coming up with our strategy has got to be start to pull together for June and that will start to dictate what the direction of travel is and therefore the money and the flow should start to follow that because ultimately otherwise it's a case of working in siloed services and protecting those bits whereas the set aside is about saying what does the whole system look like and how can we shift that whole system to move them the, the, the service and therefore the finance to match that. So I suppose in response, it is a complex issue. It's a bit of a, a wicked system issue, but we're working collaboratively to say, how do we do that? How can we shift that? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Stephen Fitzpatrick. Uh, yeah, I mean, I realise a complex issue and <clears throat> goes to the heart of integration, I think, in, in our view um, in Glasgow. And you'll see from our evidence submission that our view is it's not yet real. It's, it's talked about in abstract terms. Um, but I think... The, our capacity for it to not be real will we'll run out of road at some point in the not too distant future, given the pressure across um, the whole system. Um, coming, and coming back to, to David Tons' question, I think for us, we are looking at the um, potential around people who are currently in hospital who don't have to be there. So there's been a series of day of care audits across Glasgow and, and Scotland over the last number of years. And what we're seeing consistently is around 15% of people at any given point in time in our hospitals who potentially could be someone else. And, for, and the other 85% need to be in hospital. So really, your opportunity is around that 15%. Now, you're never going to get to zero, but somewhere between zero and 15%, I think, is where the opportunity for the whole system lies and where the potential to potentially free up some of that set aside budget uh, will lie. So that's, I suppose, the guiding uh, point for me. We also have an experience in Glasgow of the uh, changes to continuing care, so a whole system approach um, over the last number of years around those continuing care off-site beds which have transferred from acute management into the HSCP's management and, and very similar kind of um, challenge around that. How do you move from essentially an inpatient model to, to a community-based uh, model and how do you do it across a whole system with six HSCPs, an acute system which bears the risk that if it doesn't work, they're the, the provider of last resort, and that's always the driving concern for them. So, yes, we might pass resource to the HSEP, and you will promise us there. But if it doesn't happen, we have to find a way to meet the needs of that population. But we've managed to do that, and it's in our evidence as well that we have managed to shift uh, that balance. And I think it's, it's in miniature the challenge around the whole set aside and, and shifting the balance here. So we've got some direct lessons that we can learn from there. What we're doing across uh, Great Glasgow and Clyde is we're embarking on a commissioning planning process to try to, to move it from the abstract into the specific in the same way that we did with continuing care. So can we look at particular points in our system, whether it's winter beds or other aspects where you can start to point to something tangible and say, well, if we could reduce those number of beds by 30, 60, 90 from the acute system and put in place something which would give us confidence you could head off that demand, can we get an agreement to that um, but it's really important that we have whole system buy into it we need to have the conversation with clinicians and acute managers and they need to be shaping that rather than it being something that, that comes from the HSCP so it needs to be a whole system approach but we do have that experience from continuing care which uh, isn't straightforward but but has delivered some results for us thank you Jim. I think in uh, agreement with my colleagues, it is a, a complex issue. In terms of the, the experience that we have in West Lothian and the Lothian experience, um, I currently have the mental health budgets devolved to me and devolved to the partnership, which works well. Um, we have now the learning disabilities budget devolved from health and social care devolved to us as well, um, and the substance misuse budget. So there's quite a number of, sort of things that have been uh, devolved to us. Um, where the, the major challenge comes in on scheduled care, and particularly those going through the, the front door, so uh, in keeping with uh, Glasgow College, clearly 
there are four partnerships uh, in Lothian and there are three acute hospital sites. So there's a complex issue as to how you actually set real budgets in relation to activity and how does that impact on what we're doing. My um, finance officer for the IGB is heavily involved with uh, the finance team at NHS Lothian who are looking at working of how we develop this um, and how we maybe run uh, how the budgets are set this year and how, if we'd use the different funding model, how would that look uh, running in tandem with what's actually happened to give us some evidence um, and science behind how we would make future changes to the uh, unscheduled care budgets, um, which we are very closely involved in. We've been very closely involved with both parties in terms of the financial resource that we have, uh, and we have worked in an integral part to each of the management teams in both parties to look at the efficiencies that are required. Um, we um, have been embarking on that for the last few years and uh, we have a very sort of, close working relationship, particularly with the finance team at NHS Lothian to design these budgets. I think um, from a West Lothian perspective, the, we have St John's Hospital where probably around 75% of the unscheduled care activity will go through St John's. So it gives us a better sort of handle on what's actually required. We have got the complicating factor that some of that doesn't go to St John's, it either goes to the Royal Infirmary or goes to the Western. And it's how you find the balance that you give stability to the whole system and agreement to some of the sort of changes and adjustments that need to be made. And I think that's basically work in progress for us at this particular stage. Sandra Hart. Thank you very much. I think uh, Jim Forrest is the only person that's mentioned NHS. Others have mentioned integration boards, etc. But we've had evidence before, you know, from, from other uh, professionals, uh, uh, basically saying that uh, the NHS seem to s treat the set aside monies from the budget as their monies and not, you know, IGBs. Uh, so basically the question would be, um, would you agree with that, uh, that uh, there is still this culture uh, basically in that particular respect? And you're talking about something about 14% of the total budget. Uh, so why would um, not just yourselves but others agree to the fact that the NHS keep this monies? Stephen Fitzpatrick. <laughs> okay. um, I think, I think it's a matter of debate at the moment. I don't think, certainly speaking for Glasgow, there's an acceptance at all that that's the uh, NHS board's money or acute's money. I think uh, the view is that it needs to be debated about how that how we move as a whole system from the as-is to the 2B, recognising the difficulties attached to that. As I say, if you are um, uh, running an acute system in Glasgow that's running at 90-odd percent occupancy, then the notion of releasing some of that resource to invest in community alternatives is, is, a, is quite a scary prospect. So you need to respect that, but at the same time, the system can't be sustained unless you look at that funding differently. So we are absolutely committed to, to um, looking at the set-aside resources differently to do something different with that. Um, but we recognise we need a whole system approach and we need to build confidence uh, across the whole system around what the alternatives to the current use of that money would be. Thank you very much. Uh, Jim Forrest. I think from a, a Lothian perspective, I, mean, I can only reflect on the experience we have that we've been very much part and parcel of the decisions that NHS Lothian have made in terms of uh, the financial position. Um, we don't always agree, but I mean, you know, I think we are part and parcel of that whole sort of progressive way forward. I think it is a complicated issue in terms of the unscheduled care uh, side of things, which is the set aside budget and what changes we make that would be beneficial to the whole system and more importantly, deliver the outcomes that we're looking to deliver for individuals who use our service. The other thing I would say from an NHS Lothian perspective is that um, NHS Lothian has a, an unscheduled care committee uh, which brings together all of the acute uh, campuses and all of the health and social care partnerships. Um, and I chair that on behalf of NHS Lothian, which looks at unscheduled care uh, operationally over uh, the 12-month period. And we meet um, 
uh, on a monthly basis. And we also uh, use that forum for putting together our winter plan and using any additional monies that come in that is openly discussed and it's openly discussed of the outcomes that we're looking to deliver from any additional monies and that's tracked um, uh, as a whole system. Um, now, it, it I don't mean to interrupt you, Jim, but uh, basically, if you've got a, a very bad winter and flu, for instance, the NHS is going to use that money uh, in, that, in that respect. They're, not, they're going to take that in. So while well, she can plan for certain things, if you've not got <coughs> control of that 14%. Um, I don't know that it's as straightforward as taking that money in. I mean, there are certain budgets that are set aside for immunisations against flu, which are done right across the whole system. And we've had uh, pretty good immunisation rates in Lothian. Um, we have worked collectively in terms of, uh, well, last winter wasn't particularly bad, but the winter before was almost catastrophic for all kinds of reasons. Um, so I don't think there were, we're taking that money back off you to, to do that, this, that, or the other. We had to collectively look at pressures in the system and how we would fund additional activity and how we would fund any petition. Pet potential overspends in particular areas. So that wasn't the relationship that we had in, in NHS Lothian and isn't the relationship we have just now. Sandra Ross. Um, yeah, just to affirm, the, the, the approach that we're taking, in, and that's across Grampian, is the three health and social care partnerships along with NHS Grampian. And it is looking at that whole system approach. And that's one of the key issues that has been said is that it's not that's your bit of the budget and that's our bit and that's their, but looking at that whole, that as a collective, looking at a whole system and then moving that around so we don't um, start off with a position of we need to take this money from here and move it to there, but starting to look and say where is that resource best used for the whole system. Okay. Oh, Sandra, Just a, another follow-up. Certainly the evidence we had was that you know a number of the IGBs would have liked to have a wee bit more control because you get the three years funding and if you're planning, particularly in uh, drug situation and alcohol situation, uh, basically, do any of the panel here have any evidence of uh, money's been overtly taken from that, that budget, from the set-aside budgets to be used specifically uh, for acute care? Could anybody put their finger on any of that at all? No funding being shifted from the Jim social Forrest. care budget? Uh, I haven't, I haven't had money shifted from the, the social care budget to fund acute care. I mean, I think the definitions are the, the unscheduled care budget in the main is about acute care and, and how you spend it. And it's about reaching agreement of how you best use that resource rather than it taking it from one pot uh, to the other. Um, so I haven't had any sort of pressure to fire money from social care to, to provide acute care. Head shaking, Stephen Fitzpatrick. I mean, I There's always a push pull, um, and it's, it's not as straightforward as saying money will transfer from social care into acute care. But for example, the pressure we experience on our care homes budget will relate to demand coming through from the acute system to relieve pressure on the acute system. But equally, the acute system will say, uh, over time, as you reduce some of your social care budgets, that impinges on on our spend and our, our spending press as well. But no, we haven't fired any money from from social care directly and take it, we would absolutely uh, resist that as a, a, a counter-strategic uh, 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 move. Thank you very much. Uh, Bob Dorris. Uh, thank you. Really, really interesting line of question. And, and, and I, I don't know whether this is taken it forward or, or, or duplication, but I was, I was reading with interest uh, from our briefing papers, Audit Scotland said that there was a lack of collaborative leadership and cultural differences affecting the pace of change. In terms of integration, Glasgow's evidence was also really, really helpful and quite enlightening. Uh, the chief officer and the chief financial officer experienced very little engagement with NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde during the 2018-2019 in the lead-up to the budget being offered. And therefore, subsequently, when you look at other statements that Glasgow makes, it seems obvious then that they're saying to date partner bodies, budget processes continue to operate in isolation. Um, both sets of partners have been invested in the budget allocation, which they uh, delegate to the IGB and it's about this to be used for their respective services. Um, the money's not losing its identity and I was sitting on this committee full time when integration was was being 
put on a statutory basis. Uh, the only reason the government put it on a statutory basis is uh, health boards and local authorities several years ago were asked to do it, and they simply didn't do it. It's now put on a statutory basis where you have no choice, not you personally, I'm not personalising it to you, you. I'm sure you are the leaders in the room today. Um, where, where, where it's now a duty to go on with it. And then Glasgow, despite some really good work that we've heard about today, Glasgow's still saying that money not losing its identity and money put in, you expect to get back out your side of the system again. Um, where is the leadership in the system to change all of this? And we, can you point to examples of where that has happened in really good practice? And is, is there a lack of... Is there a lack of leadership in some quarters? I know it's very difficult to identify where you think there is a lack of leadership, but clearly there must be. OK, so starting with your understanding of your own position in addressing these issues, but also uh, more widely, if you wish, who would like to kick off? Sandra Ross? Thank you, Chair. Um, I can only give my the view to the Aberdeen um, area, so I'm part of the... Um, within my role as Chief Officer and part of the system leadership team within NHS Grampian, which the other two um, Chief Officers from the Integration Authority are on as well. Um, I think that, that that's and that's what it's called as a system leadership team, so that's from ACUTE, that's from the IJBs. There is a strong sense there that we are a system and there's a strong sense that we are in this um, as moving forward as a whole Grampian with the three IJBs and that only by collaboration and working together that will be there. So I would say that there's a recognition from the Audit Scotland report about what was said, um, that, but there's also an understanding that that's the direction of travel. I would say that from our own um, leadership team as well, from my own leadership team, that we're certainly hinging back, um, anchoring back into the other areas as well, making sure that we have strong connections. Provoke a response, can you then? Of, of, co of course there was in relation to that. So can you, can you point to an example in Grampian where money put in by either a local authority or the health board has been actually used imaginatively and not just been taken back out by by the, the same partner to spend what they've always been spending it on. Mm. Maybe come back to that, because yeah. clearly that will take a little thinking. Yeah. Uh, Stephen Fitzpatrick. I suppose uh, that's a delicate question. Um, but for me, I think, looking at it, some of it is structural rather than personal around le individuals and leaders within the system. I think if you have a structure where the money flows through, for example, the City Council and through the Health Board, then it's difficult to see a way where the accountability doesn't flow back out uh, of that. Certainly there's been a conscious effort, and we reflect this in our evidence, to lose the identity of the funding within the, the elements of the system that the partnership controls. There's been a really conscious effort to do that. So, for example, um, I, I led a review of our occupational therapy services, um, which we inherited a separate NHS and uh, council component of, and we've brought that service together and we've brought the funding together and so on. So that's something within our direct control. But I think there is a structural issue, um, which is still to be remedied in terms of how the money flows in and out, and I think that, that then places some constraints around um, the leadership. I think there's also a cultural point where it takes time to shift, and, and we're on a cultural journey within the partnership, but we live it every day, whereas if you are the councillor, you are uh, the health board, and you're sitting outside that and not exposed to it in the same way, you're still inhabiting the same environment, it's maybe not realistic to expect that cultural change to take place um, on the same time scales. But um, I think there's still a way to go, and that, that is reflected. We, we do have um, some concerns that the conditions don't yet fully exist to give full effect to, to the kind of uh, policy intentions of, of the legislation. We think there's some, some work to do there across the system. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think some of it hinges on, you know, the understanding of the, the legislation uh, so that if services are devolved, you know, there's still a feeling from... Uh, the funding parties that they're accountable for certain things rather than this uh, other entity being accountable for it. And we've had to work through that, and that's work in progress. And I think that's probably at the nub of, you know, where we need to shift the sort of culture and, and attitude uh, and have good governance structures and oversight to allow that to happen. Uh, and that's been a, an, on, an ongoing development. Um, so I think from my uh, experience uh, locally, both from the local authority point of view and from NHS Lothian point of view, we've I've 
as an individual with my chief finance officer have been very much part and parcel of the discussions both on a yearly basis but also from a, a local authority point of view um, we were uh, very much there at the beginning of setting out a sort of five-year financial plan for across all of the local authority services and actually uh, were listened to uh, and some of the sort of ideas that we put forward in terms of funding uh, were taken on board and have been passed on to us. And similarly, uh, whilst we don't quite have the same sort of, uh, time, time in terms of long-term view from an NHS funding point of view, um, again, similar discussions have happened there. Um, so I've been able to, to use money that's come into the partnership uh, and make a decision to say whereabouts in this community model should we spend this money? So I've used money to fund uh, additional uh, community support workers for reablement service. And it doesn't all necessarily mean that that contribution has come from the local authority. Even if it's a uh, local authority employed staff, I've been able to, to use uh, money across the whole system to allow that to happen. That, that, that's a useful concrete example. I, I wasn't deliberately trying to catch anyone out. I just genuinely wanted to, to get an idea of an example of where the money has lost its identity. So that's, so that's helpful. I, I, don't, I don't know if, if you're able to kind of give an Can example. You yeah, in Aberdeen, for example, um, we have done an initiative as part of some of our delayed discharge work where we've been, rather than just buying a wing of a care home and putting people there. What we've been doing instead is in care homes that people would want to go to, we've been buying a cohort of beds in each of them so that people, rather than people going somewhere they don't want to go, there's reserved access from a hospital setting for an intermediate care setting into those care homes of choice. Now, previously, I mean, I'm, I, I'm employed by Aberdeen City Council, although I'm a partnership manager and I work for uh, the, the Health and Social Care Partnership. Previously, there would have been all kinds of rammies about, you know, GPs saying, why are these extra people going into these beds? We have to provide medical cover to them. There's all kinds of debates that would happen there across different parts of a system that maybe wouldn't have talked to each other just as well prior to integration. I have a shared budget now. It's not a council budget. It's not an NHS budget. It doesn't matter what's on the ledger. So I was very able then to talk with our primary care colleagues and agree the appropriate contracts and service level agreements to actually support the medical cover and nursing cover and so on to allow the seamless flow and the turnover of people out into those kinds of care home settings. So you had what had historically would have been spending that would have sat on the council side of the business, which is the more purchase of social care within the care home sector. And you had the more NHS side of the business, which was the kind of community nursing, the GP medical cover and so on. And we were able to sort that without lots of go-between because it literally all came from my one budget and the money had lost its identity in that bit because it was about delivering a goal as opposed to who got council bit and who got the NHS bit of the pie. That's one of the things we're keen to hear, uh, yeah. Bob Doris. No, 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 it is helpful. I mean, again, not, not for this morning because of time constraints, but, but, but some more information on that, I think, would, would, would yeah. be quite helpful. I mean, in Glasgow, and uh, I pay tribute to, to David Williams as the accountable officer uh, in Glasgow, who, who's, who's hugely respected, but the point has also been made that when you have that accountable officer being the head of either a section of the NHS or in David's case, the, the head of social work in Glasgow, can that, so not, not specifically talking about Glasgow, that's just an illustrative example, can that be an issue where you, so the single go-to person who's in charge of everything is so closely identified with either the NHS or so closely identified with the local authority, can that entrench some of those cultural issues that um, I think Mr Fitzpatrick and Mr Gilmore were talking about? Any, any thoughts on that? I mean, I think, I think we've all got to be employed by someone and some, because uh, the AGB doesn't employ anybody. So, so I think, it, I think it could. A short answer is yes, it could. But I mean, if I take my own situation, being employed by uh, the NHS as I've been through my whole career, I'm based in the Civic Centre in West Lothian as part of the council's executive management team. I am responsible for all of the social work services uh, and I'm the go-to person for all of the services that are there. So I'd probably like to think that through the, the leadership uh, of my team that these barriers have been taken down and we've been able to move things forward. 
If that's a similar view, I'm, I'm not. I just want to make sure we, we, we cover every base when we're asking questioning. But if that's a similar view, don't don't feel the need to come in on that. I think, and we, I think we, we see can, lots yeah. of nodding heads from both Aberdeen and Glasgow, so that's um, that's helpful. I, I mean, I mean, finally, I, I, an interest of mine has been uh, money spent on housing adaptions over the years, previously in the, lo uh, in the local government committee, and that that freezing of ten million pounds across Scotland for the social sector. So budget retained, but a real term was cut over a number of years in relation to that. And at a constituent level, I've been writing to uh, Scottish Government and uh, the Indicating Joint Board in Glasgow, uh, who, who point to the budgets that IGBs have in relation to housing adaptions, and that's what Kevin Stewart would, would say as the Minister. So I did get some some figures for, for Glasgow. Was that's why I was checking my phone earlier. So I think David Williams told me that in 2018-19, £2 million was used from the, the Indicating Joint Board for adaptions. Within Glasgow, so I don't know what it is for for nineteen twenty. Um, when I'd written to the government, they referred to a parliamentary question that another member had asked previously in relation to this. This was back in March. Um, if for, this is for Scotland convener, it was thirty eight point four million pounds for the year sixteen seventeen was used by IJBs uh, or, or the joint authorities across Scotland, and that was the latest year that the government had uh, figures for. Um, so I don't know whether there's any it's difficult to ask any trends or patterns in relation to that, but all morning we've been talking about how we have a better use of budget to effect reduce delay discharge, <laughs> enable women at home, do preventative work. And there's a really robust good example that is housing tenure neutral convener in relation to how we can do some real good work to sustain people in their home. So what's the story? It'd be nice just to hear what the story has been in each of the areas uh, today, uh, to date, and whether or not you capture some of that information, because a number is just a number. Two million in Glasgow is fantastic, but three million is better than two million, obviously. But what we really want to know is for three million, what's the difference we get? Do we get less delayed discharge? Do we get more people sustained in their homes? How do we measure outcomes for the money spent? That would be really helpful. And, and, and because we're tied for time, if I can add to that simply a question, are there barriers to housing adaptations uh, and other things that we need to take take up in order to address those barriers while you're covering? Yvonne Lawton. So we have very good relationships with our housing colleagues um, uh, and have developed a, a joint accommodation strategy to clearly set out uh, our housing needs. Um, it is true that it sometimes takes quite a long time for those adaptations to be realised, um, so people can be delayed in hospital whilst they are adaptations actually take place so um, one of the considerations is about wh what sort of interim arrangements can you have in place that will facilitate discharge whilst the adaptations occur so it's not not so much that um we have problems securing funding for the adaptations it's much more about the logistical um, aspects associated with that Kenny O'Brien. certainly there is pressure on budgets there's an increasing demand in regards to that and i've certainly been involved in discussions in previous years in relation to that um, I would say that in regards to process and timeline, um, I think we've done relatively well in Aberdeen City in that regard. No matter how you cut it, if you're making structural adaptations to an individual's own home, there will always be a lag of time um, from the identification of that need, even just simple going from architect to plan to then actually physical bricks and mortar. There will always be a gap no matter how you cut it in that regard. We are trying to do two things in that regard to minimise delay. Number one, we are trying very hard to get upstream. So part of the work we've done in embedding social work staff and in embedding work in the discharge hubs is that, for example, if someone is going in surgically for an amputation and we know they live in a tenement three floors up, rather than waiting till they're referred, we're getting housing and other such things done at an earlier point so that before they're anywhere near being clinically ready for discharge the work the wheels are already turning in that regard we also have dedicated occupational therapy staff who are focused on purely this type of work so we have a pathway out our arms length company bon Accord care has a housing occupational therapist whose job it is to do this and to turn this and who has the expertise to try and cut through some of the flack in that regards. The other thing we've invested in as well is in our housing colleagues, because we work actually very well with our housing colleagues in Aberdeen, where we've invested in where the partnership has taken on the tenancies of two disabled access wheelchair accessible flats within the city. And we have adapted them quite significantly so they can work with a wide, wide spectrum of individuals with different occupational therapy related needs and adaptations. So whilst we try and constrain the time, 
that individuals require to wait until adaptations and equipment or rehousing even is sometimes done, we do have a place that is far more appropriate for them than uh, remaining in an acute hospital bed for them to actually keep their skills and independence up. And also sometimes for the occupational therapist to try different things in a more modular, adapted setting. And that helps around there as well. Thank you very much. And Stephen Fitzpatrick. So in, um, in Glasgow, as ever, uh, like others, it's always a budget that's under pressure. It's one we've protected over the years. Well, social care budgets have been reducing, so we, we prioritise that. We do have a strategic priority attached to our partnership with housing to try to shift the balance of care from long-term care in particular uh, to support pe more people at home. So again, we would anticipate uh, as an outcome from that that pressure on that budget would accelerate over time. So we need to look at uh, how we how we potentially uh, grow that. But it's certainly a live issue in Glasgow. I think two weeks ago we had the, the um, launch of our joint protocol, jointly developed with the housing sector around adaptations and housing solutions. So we're working very much uh, with that um, sector to try to drive solutions and make sure there's a culture across housing and the health and social care partnership to work together to, to make the most of the resources that are available. But I think it's marginal as a, a factor in delayed discharges in Glasgow, and it's, fa it's marginal as a cause of unscheduled admissions to the acute system. It's more about the balance of care within the community, I think, that we're, we're looking at that particular element. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, can I thank all of the witnesses uh, for their evidence this morning? That's been very helpful. Uh, there are one or two items where you offered to provide us with further information. We look forward uh, to receiving that. Uh, in due course, and uh, we'll briefly suspend resuming public session uh, in, a, in two or three minutes' time. Meeting. Uh, we have one item in public session remaining, which is agenda item two, subordinate legislation. Uh, this is the National Health Service, General Dental Services, Scotland Amendment Regulations uh, 2019. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee considered this instrument earlier today 
and uh, determined that it did not need to draw the attention of Parliament to this instrument for, on any grounds within its remit. Can I invite any comments that there may be from members on this instrument? Anna Sarwar. The dentists are happy. I'm okay with it. <laughs> that's I should a, have, to a former dentist and I like being a dentist. That's a, that's, that counts as a succinct comment. Uh, are there any further comments? There being none, uh, is the committee agreed to make no recommendations? Thank you very much. Uh, we will now move into private session.